Hello, a very good morning to you. There are expectations this morning of another major reversal to the mini-budget. The Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, has cut short his trip to the International Monetary Fund in Washington and is returning to the UK earlier than planned. This follows days of open revolt amongst Tory MPs. But Mr Kwarteng insists his job is safe and that he's going nowhere. Pressure is also growing on the Prime Minister, Liz Truss, to save her administration. Her key pledge to scrap the planned increase in corporation tax from 19% to 25% is widely seen as a likely casualty in the coming days. So let's just remind you of what's led up to this latest turn of events. Well, three weeks ago, Kwasi Kwarteng announced his so-called mini-budget. Speaking in the Commons, he promised to make tax cuts worth £45 billion. The pound slumped almost immediately and fell to its lowest level in 37 years by mid-afternoon. Following fallout over the weekend, sterling fell close to $1.03, a record low for the pound. The Bank of England then stepped in, launching a huge £65 billion intervention to stop a run on pension funds. The night before his speech at the Tory party conference, the Chancellor U-turned on his plan to scrap the 45 pence top rate of income tax paid by those earning more than £150,000. The Bank of England Governor, Andrew Bailey, then announced it wouldn't extend its support of the gilt market beyond its deadline of today. And leaving a meeting with the IMF yesterday, the Chancellor refused to rule out another U-turn, this time on corporation tax. From Washington, our US correspondent, Mark Stone, reports. An airport dash for a Chancellor under pressure. Kwasi Kwarteng's car disappeared into the Washington night after an embassy event and a hastily rearranged early departure. He'd spent the day at the International Monetary Fund's annual meeting, defending his mini-budget, even as rumours of another U-turn swirled across the Atlantic. Our position hasn't changed. I will come up uh, with the uh, medium-term fiscal plan on the 31st of October, as I uh, said earlier in the week, uh, and there'll be more detail there. And you'll be Chancellor and Liz Truss will be Prime Minister this time next month? Absolutely, 100%. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> He wasn't at the big meetings through the day, like the G20 gathering of finance ministers and bank chiefs. <laughs> Did you welcome these potential U-turns, more no, U-turns? Words move markets, and so there were very few here. The German bank chief. So what's your reaction to what's happening in the UK at the moment? The European Central Bank president. What's your, what's your reaction to what's happening in the UK? The US Treasury secretary. What's your message to the UK chancellor at the moment? But the Chancellor wasn't here. Instead, a UK official, red government binder in hand, explained to organisers that a deputy would step in for the closed-door meeting. Not entirely unusual, but surprising, given that they do all want to know what's happening in London. Any reason why the Chancellor wasn't there? No. That's a question for the Chancellor. A few rooms away, the IMF boss arrived for her keynote news conference. We have a world economy that has been hit by one shock after another. An unrelented pandemic, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, climate disasters on all continents. It was a sobering reminder of a global economy on the rocks. You said um, in your opening remarks that a complex time requires steady hands on the policy levers. So my, my question simply is, do you think the British government's hands are steady? If the evidence is that there has to be a recalibration, uh, it is right for governments uh, to do so. The Bank of England action was appropriate. There was a, a financial uh, risk to, to financial stability. She and the Chancellor met before his early departure. The focus, the IMF says, was the importance of policy coherence. The Chancellor is back in London early, he says, to focus on a coherent fiscal plan. Mark Stone, Sky News in Washington. Well, joining me now is International Trade Minister Greg Hans. Very good morning to morning. you. Thanks for coming in. Why is the Chancellor flying back from the IMF in Washington early? Well, he has been there for two days. He's had extensive meetings with world financial leaders, finance ministers, central bank governors. Uh, it's not unusual. I've been a government minister about 10 years to come back uh, a day early uh, from an international visit. Uh, he's coming back for discussions with colleagues, 
We obviously have the medium-term fiscal plan coming up on the 31st of October. So just in a couple of weeks' time, there's work to be done, there's conversations to be had with colleagues. Uh, but the major uh, meat of the meetings of the IMF and the World Bank <clears throat> have finished and uh, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor Exchequer has been there now for two days. I think it's not unusual to come back a day early. So he's coming back for discussions with colleagues. Are U-turns on any aspects of the mini-budget being considered as part of those discussions? Well, look, I mean, the, I saw the Prime Minister yesterday, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor are absolutely determined to deliver on the growth plan. That is what the country needs. That's what the economy needs. Uh, the Chancellor will be setting out his plans. It's not right for me uh, to speculate uh, just two weeks in advance of those plans. I was a Treasury Minister myself, Chief Secretary of the Treasury before. I think we're just going to have to wait and see uh, what the Chancellor says in the medium-term fiscal plan <clears throat> on the 31st of October. But it's possible there'll be reversals. Well, look, let's wait and see. You won't have long to wait um, to the 31st of October for the Chancellor to lay out those plans. I do say that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor are absolutely resolute, determined, uh, the growth plan, the centrepiece, but we'll have to see some of the detail, including a full forecast from the Office for Budget Responsibility uh, on the 31st of October. Let me just ask you about a couple of aspects, because a lot of people, this will affect a lot of people after all. What about the scrapping of the rise in national insurance? Will that definitely go ahead? The, well, that's already been voted on in the House of Commons, got voted on on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday evening of this week. Um, so that is going ahead. Uh, that's already been voted on. It's already been okay, passed. So that's going ahead. What about the scrapping of the rise in corporation tax then? Well, uh, in terms of, as I said, the, the Chancellor, the Prime Minister, are absolutely determined to stick to their plans. But let's wait and for the uh, how this will all pan out in the wider scheme in the medium term fiscal plan uh, that you won't have long to wait for comes before the end of the month. Do you rule out any changes to the mini-budget? Well, I'm not going to speculate on the medium-term fiscal plan that's going to be coming uh, on the 31st of October before the end of the month. As I say, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor are absolutely determined, resolute. I've worked very closely uh, with both of them uh, in government. I was uh, Liz Truss's uh, number two at trade before, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng's number two at the business department. I know them well and I know how determined they are to deliver economic growth deliver on the growth plan, some of the detail, the wider context, will quite rightly have to wait for for the medium-term fiscal plan published uh, on uh, Monday in two weeks. So they want to push ahead with their growth plan, but you talk about the detail, some of the detail could change. Well, I'm saying that some of the detail will be laid out on the 31st of October, again, with the full forecast from the Office of Budget Responsibility, the full scorecard, in a, a usual uh, Treasury and Office of Budget Responsibility way, working together, uh, working together as it should be. That's a long time to wait, the 31st of October. Are we not going to get any update later today? Will we get an update today on how the government is going to respond to the, the market turmoil? Well, look, the government will make responses as appropriate uh, as events happen. But the, uh, the, the absolutely commitment is to publish the medium-term fiscal plan. This is looking at how the government is going to pay for everything, how the government is going to set its budget, uh, in the coming years, and that will be laid out in just two weeks' time. Well, yes, but we're in the middle of market turmoil. The markets clearly are speculating as well about whether there'll be changes to the mini-budget, not least corporation tax. The Ch George Osborne, former Chancellor, of course, thinks that decisions should be made quicker than that. Let's take a look at what he tweeted yesterday. Given the pain being caused the real economy by the financial turbulence, it's not clear why it's in anyone's interest to wait 18 more days before the inevitable U-turn on the mini-budget. Well, look, uh, I used to work uh, uh, for uh, George Osborne for many years as his chief secretary to the Treasury, um, so I know him well. But I do think the government has been absolutely clear that the plans, uh, the detailed plans, will be laid out in the medium-term fiscal plan uh, coming before the end of the month. It's only a couple of weeks. The Chancellor, of course, gave interviews yesterday in Washington on the current situation in regards to the global turmoil and financial markets. Of course, this is not something happening just in the UK. There are some specific UK things going on, but there is a global problem going on with the, both the rise in energy prices, the rise in global inflation. Uh, there's been interventions, not only in this country, the Bank of Japan has had to intervene, the yen has fallen to a 30-year low. This is not a UK-only thing. 
But as you say, there are elements that are absolutely specific to the UK. And you supported Rishi Sunak in his campaign for leadership. And he said it would be complacent and irresponsible to ignore the risks of the markets losing confidence in the British economy. He also warned that what he described as Liz Truss's unfunded spending commitments, he said they would force up inflation and interest rates and increase borrowing costs. He was right, wasn't he? Well, I mean, different things were said during the Conservative leadership contest, which, of course, is an entirely natural thing. The two candidates are laid out uh, their approaches, their stalls. Uh, Liz Truss, as you rightly pointed out, I voted for Rishi Sunak, but Liz Truss won that uh, contest. She's delivering on the plans but, that but she Sunak laid out. But Rishi Sunak was right about what those plans would well, mean Well, Liz Truss is delivering on the plans that she laid out during that leadership contest. We've got more detail to come in the medium-term fiscal plan uh, before the end of the month. And it's right that the Conservative Party uh, be united behind our selected uh, Conservative Party leader and now Prime Minister, Liz Truss. Would the markets have more confidence if Rishi Sunak was Prime Minister as you'd wanted him to be? Well, there's always these kind of what-if uh, style questions. Uh, but, you know, as we know from the leadership contest, uh, Rishi Sunak did not win the leadership contest. Liz Truss did win the leadership contest. I am dealing with the situation uh, that we are in, which is that Liz Truss is our Prime Minister. She has my confidence. She should have the confidence of all Conservative MPs, the whole Conservative Party, and actually deserves the confidence of the country as we go into quite difficult economic times with the rise in energy uh, driven by Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, uh, the turmoil in global financial markets. We need to get behind our Prime Minister as a party and show Liz Truss uh, the confidence that she deserves in Kwasi Kwarteng to make these difficult decisions going forward. You say we should have confidence in the Prime Minister and the Chancellor. If there were more changes to the mini-budget, there's always already been one big reversal. Is Kwasi Kwarteng's position tenable? I think totally. I mean, Kwasi Kwarteng himself... Uh, said yesterday he's 100% sure he will still be in position. Uh, I know the Prime Minister has got total confidence in Kwasi Kwarteng. I've worked very closely uh, with Kwasi. He's an incredibly capable person, a very, very bright uh, person who makes uh, good judgment calls. And I have absolute confidence in Kwasi Kwarteng as Chancellor of the Exchequer. So if he was to introduce some kind of change to corporation tax, either reverse his plan or to, to have corporation tax tax rise by a smaller amount, you still think that his, he has credibility with the markets? Well, you're asking me to speculate on... Well, it's the speculation that the markets are doing, that a lot of Tory MPs are pushing for. But it's not right for me to speculate. What I am saying is the Prime Minister <clears throat> and the Chancellor Exchequer are absolutely determined on their course uh, and more detail will be laid out uh, before too long in the medium-term fiscal plan on the 31st of October. The Times is reporting that what they describe as senior Conservatives are holding <clears throat> talks about replacing Liz Truss with a, a joint ticket of Rishi Sunak and Penny Mordaunt. You're shaking your head. Have you heard anything about this? I don't recognise that story at all. Uh, I, I was a supporter of Rishi Sunak over the summer. I'd be very surprised at that story. Uh, I was talking only yesterday with Penny Mordaunt. I, I, I don't recognise that story at all. But what we do need to do is the Conservative Party uh, does need to unite uh, behind our Prime Minister. She was our choice of the Conservative Party just a few weeks ago. We need to remain uh, united, get together behind Liz Truss, Kwasi Kwarteng as our team. Even though her policies have caused turmoil on the markets and seen people's mortgage rates shoot up? Well, I disagree with that. Uh, yes, there are some UK-specific factors, uh, but overall, the uh, global situation caused originally, of course, by uh, Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, the, uh, also the recovery of the economy coming out of the pandemic. You know, these are a backdrop uh, across all G7 countries. You know, this year and last year, the UK is growing stronger than any other G7 country. Uh, we are, our position, we have some, some serious issues coming up. Um, but other countries are facing a similar set of problems. The rise in energy prices, the turmoil in global markets, uh, intervention by central banks around the world, rises in interest rates, rises in mortgage rates, energy price crunches in different European countries. And there's a lot going on in the world situation, the world economy. 
but a lot of economists, including ones at the Bank of England, would say this is UK specific. Well, I think we heard in your... They would take into account the global factors, but they would say there, there are, are some UK, UK specific, specific factors, problems. But we heard in your clip earlier from uh, the head of the IMF about uh, global forces and global turmoil. You know, that is the principal focus of the, the IMF meeting that's just been happening. It's been looking at those uh, global forces, the interventions that have been needed, uh, some of the problems a lot of countries are facing with energy. Um, our European neighbours are, are facing a very significant crunch on both energy supply and energy prices. You know, these are something that are not unique to the UK. Are Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss going to be in their positions yes. in a month's time? Absolutely. OK, Greg Hans, we appreciate Thank your you. time. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. So let's take a look then at how the papers are reporting this growing pressure on the government. And the Financial Times, first of all, reports on rumours that Liz Truss is poised to reverse some of the policies in the recent mini-budget. The Guardian suggests that any U-turn would be a significant blow to Ms Truss's authority. The Express believes a change of direction would calm the markets. The Daily Telegraph leads with the Chancellor's vow to fight on, insisting he's not going anywhere. According to The Times, disgruntled Tory MPs are looking to replace Liz Truss with one of her leadership competitors, Rishi Sunak or Penny Mordaunt. The Daily Mail says she has just 17 days to save her job. Do see where there's still to come on the show. I'm going to be speaking to the Shadow Climate Secretary, Ed Miliband. Also ahead, protesting the rising energy costs, I'll speak to the restaurant owner who's going to back to basics and serving a meal without the use of gas or electricity. And the emergency rescue plan by the Bank of England ends today. How will markets be affected? I'll speak to a senior economic advisor to the House Treasury Committee. Now, a new video has been released showing increasingly panicked calls being made by leading politicians trapped in the US Capitol when rioters stormed the building in January last year. During what was expected to be the final hearing into the attack by Donald Trump supporters, a congressional committee also voted to subpoena the former president to force him to give evidence about his role. From Washington, James Matthews reports. The door has been breached and people are gaining access into the Capitol. They held back this film for the final stages. We have got to get to finish the proceedings or else it would have had to come to New footage from behind the scenes at the Capitol. Senator Schumer is at a secure location. We need an area for the House members. They're putting on their tear gas masks. <laughs> From secure rooms beneath the building, politicians negotiated protection from the mob, for themselves and for a government. We have some senators who are still in their hideaways. They need massive personnel now. Can you get the Maryland National Guard to come to? Yeah, why don't you get the president to tell them to leave the Capitol, Mr. Attorney General? He admitted he had lost the election. This committee hearing said the evidence showed an effort by Donald Trump to ignore the rule of law and stay in power. Let's get right to the violence. Violence before voting, said Roger Stone, in video that featured well-known Trump allies and talk of ignoring an election. The key thing to do is to claim victory. Possession is nine-tenths of the law. He's going to declare victory. But that doesn't mean he's the winner. He's just going to say he's the winner. We were shown Secret Service emails dated before January the 6th. Evidence said this committee that Trump was aware of impending violence. Their plan is to literally kill people. Please, please take this tip seriously and investigate further. The House and the Senate will be... It is a body of evidence around January the 6th that Donald Trump has been summoned to address. The committee that accuses him has subpoenaed the former president to give evidence. I am offering this resolution that the committee direct the chairman to issue a subpoena for relevant documents and testimony under oath from Donald John Trump. These congressional hearings have amounted to a pool together of a case against Donald Trump surrounding the attack on the Capitol. Whether that's heard and tested in an actual courtroom will be a matter for this country's Justice Department.
Whether he entertains his committee of accusers in the meantime is open to question. Donald Trump has already dismissed its work as a politically motivated witch hunt. James Matthews, Sky News in Washington. Families of victims of a Florida school shooting are outra have outraged that the shooter was spared the death penalty. 24-year-old Nicholas Cruz pleaded guilty to murdering 14 students and three staff members in 2018. But jurors could not unanimously agree that he should be given the death penalty, and at least one juror voted for a life sentence instead. Families of the victims sobbed and comforted each other as they heard the jury's decision. What it says to me, what it says to my family, what it says to the other families is that his life meant more than the 17 that were murdered and the 17 that were shot and the thousands of people in that school, in that community that are terrorized and traumatized every single day. I'm disgusted with the system. That you can allow 17 dead and 17 others shot and wounded and not give the death penalty. What do we have the death penalty for? What is the purpose of it? You set a precedent today. You set a precedent for the next mass killing and nothing happens to you. You'll get life in jail. I'm sorry. That is not okay. The Children's Commissioner has asked all police forces in England and Wales to provide figures on how many children have been strip-searched by officers since 2018. Well, let's speak to our correspondent, Milena Veselinovic, uh, who can tell us more about this. So, Milena, tell us a little bit more of the background and what's prompted this call. Well, this was triggered by an incident in which a 15-year-old black schoolgirl was strip-searched by two female Met Police officers, but without another adult present because she was wrongly suspected of carrying cannabis. Now, a safeguarding review found that that should have never happened and that racism likely played a part. The Met apologised, but it did trigger this probe into how many children it strip-searched, and the answer is 650 in a two-year period. And this probe, the previous probe by the Children's Commissioner, also found that worryingly in a quarter of those cases, there was no appropriate adult present. Now, that could be a parent or a guardian or someone like a social worker. It also found that black boys were disproportionately searched. For example, in 2018, two-thirds of all boys who were searched were black. So that all prompted the Children's Commissioner to widen this probe into all forces in England and Wales so she could, in her own words, reassure herself that this is not a systemic problem. Now, the Met Police has responded to this, and in a statement, they said, ensuring the safeguarding of every child who is subject to a search is an absolute priority. We got it wrong with Child Q, which is the 15-year-old girl, and we are making significant efforts to ensure our approach puts the child at the heart of decision-making. We have been listening to our communities and partners and have made changes as we balance the policing need for this type of search with the considerable impact it can have on young people. And the Children's Commissioner says that the strip search of children, which is very intrusive, should only only be done when it's very urgent to do so in order to either save the life of the child or protect others, not as a routine exercise. And the results of this new wider probe will be published early next year. Milena, thanks very much indeed. Let's return to our top story now. The Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, is returning from London from, to London from Washington early as another mini-budget U-turn is expected. Well, I'm joined now by Conservative peer Lord Vasey. Uh, very good morning to you. Thanks so much for talking to us this morning. Uh, what do you make of the fact that the Chancellor is cutting short his trip to the IMF meetings in Washington? Uh, is this a sign of the government in crisis? It's not a good sign. It doesn't look like the government is in uh, control. Jim Callaghan, the Labour Prime Minister in the 1970s, famously, famously came back from an IMF conference in the Caribbean, I think, and came back to the headline, crisis, what crisis? And I'm afraid that the Chancellor coming back a day early doesn't fill one with confidence. I can see on your ticker on the Sky News screen that Greg Hands, the new Trade Minister, who's a Rishi Sunak supporter and a sign that the government is now trying to broaden its support is saying it's not unusual, but it is quite unusual for this to happen. 
And so what do you expect to happen to, during the course of today? Do you think that revisions to the mini-budget, more revisions to the mini-budget are on the cards? I think it looks inevitable. I mean, the government has absolutely no easy choices after the mini-budget caused such a catastrophic um, economic crisis. I think that there may be... Uh, I, th I think it is inevitable there will be changes to the mini-budget. What is now kind of being mooted is perhaps there'll be some sort of compromise that can still be presented as radical economics, as in corporation tax will rise, famously Kwasi Kwarteng reversed the Rishi Sunak plan to put uh, corporation tax up from 19 to 25, but maybe he'll put it up, say, to 21 to 22 and say it's still not as high as it would have been under Rishi Sunak, although he is now trying to balance the books. The other key reversal might be that he's already uh, done a U-turn in when he's going to make his statement on public spending to the end of October, maybe he'll bring that forward as well, and that would justify his coming back early from Washington. But what would that do to his authority if he did have to make changes like that? Well, this is the uh, terrible dilemma the government faces itself in, because obviously you rely on the authority of the Prime Minister and the Chancellor to give confidence to the markets and therefore to boost the economy. Uh, if he does a U-turn like this, it will be very damaging to his authority. Can he get through it? Who knows? The fact that people are speculating about the Prime Minister's leadership this early in her premiership is not ideal. Uh, but I think he's just got to bite the bullet. He's got to try and give the markets confidence in the British economy. And if he can do that, then perhaps he can say, well, I had to do some difficult choices, slightly humiliating choices, but the result is stabilisation. I can now move forward. So you think he can survive? He can introduce changes, more changes to the mini-budget and still keep his job? Yes, I think he can survive, partly because if he went, it would expose the Prime Minister even more. Um, it is always possible. I mean, the trouble that the Tory party has is if they have lost confidence in the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, what on earth do they do? I don't think the country could stomach yet another leadership change. So if the situation is that the Chancellor has to make a slightly embarrassing well, very embarrassing, you turn on his mini budget, but can get through it and the markets calm down, then one can have a period of calm in which he can try and re-establish his authority. So it is not inevitable that if he makes changes that he has to go. You say that the party couldn't stomach another leadership change, and yet there are reports in today's Times newspaper, for example, of a, of a joint Sunak-Penny Mordant ticket. Have you heard any rumours like that? I haven't heard those rumours. It wouldn't surprise me if people were speculating about that. I mean, the trouble is that Rishi Sunak, in effect, he and his allies predicted this kind of economic problem if Liz Truss went ahead with her radical pro-growth um, reforms at a time of economic uncertainty. So there is a certain amount, dare I say it, of schadenfreude, I suspect, on the part of Rishi Sunak supporters. If there was to be a change of leadership, and at the moment I couldn't really countenance it, it would have to be the case that Tory MPs would simply have to choose Rishi Sunak as their Prime Minister and say that was a done deal, let's get on with it. But at the moment, I think it would be almost impossible to see them making that choice at this stage because it just would look chaotic. What is the mood, though, would you say, amongst Tory backbenchers? Well, I think the mood is, is relatively bleak in the sense that this is a self-inflicted wound. We didn't have to have a mini budget that was so radical uh, and which wasn't joined up both with tax cuts accompanied by uh, proposals on public spending. But having said that, I think uh, there is also a yearning for the current leadership to steady the ship. So to give them the opportunity in the next couple of weeks to do the things that may be necessary in order to get back on course. Uh, even if they do that and they get back on course and people criticise them and then say, what is the point of a trust government? The fact is that they, I think it would be preferable for the Conservative Party to keep the current leadership in place uh, and to move forward. And, you know, it sounds a bit trite to put it like this, but to put this behind them and reset the government's agenda. You talk about the things that are necessary uh, to... to get them back on course, what are those things? What steps do need to be taken to steady the ship? Well, the fundamental point is joined up uh, economics. So the fundamental point to get the ship back on course is to say uh, that uh, we're going to 
as it were, change course in terms of the depth of the tax cuts we were proposing, you've got to remember that the 45p tax cut, which in it, it in the cold light of day, was a potentially sensible move to simplify the tax system. And it was something that George Osborne would have liked to have done, but the politics defeated him in 2010. Uh, was a, was a very small tax cut in the scheme of things. The key point is the gap between the level of tax cuts and the level of public spending cuts that are needed to meet that. And Liz Truss has been put in a corner because it's, uh, the parties made quite clear that they wouldn't support a reduction in welfare benefits. So they've got to find a way to uh, go back on their mini budget, but not present it as a complete and utter U-turn uh, and to put forward credi credible public spending plans that balance uh, their tax reforms with their public spending plans. If the markets accept that, and Margaret Thatcher famously said, you cannot buck the markets. If the markets accept that, then perhaps the government lives to fight another day. So they've got to just put this behind them uh, and get to a position where there are no more kind of economic shocks. And economic shocks sound, you know, kind of theoretical, you know, what's happening in the bond market? What does that mean to you and me in real life? It means increases in interest rates. It means a hit on our mortgages uh, and it means economic uncertainty which is very very scary for a lot of people the key for me has always been if we can get through the winter and people feel the government has been on their side and helped get through the winter and Liz Truss presented a pretty comprehensive package on energy prices and supporting consumers and businesses on energy and we can get through to the spring relatively unscathed we're not going to get through unscathed then the government has a fighting chance. So that's what they have to do in the next two weeks. They have to calm the markets, and by calming the markets, they calm the economy, they calm you and me as citizens, and they calm their Tory MPs. OK. Ed Vasey, Lord Vasey, thanks very much indeed for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks. Well, let's get the view of Labour now. I'm joined here in the studio by Shadow Climate Change Secretary Ed Miliband. Very good morning to you. Thanks it's for good coming to be in. with you. Um, so Kwasi Kwarteng, the Chancellor, is coming back from Washington from the IMF meetings early. What do you read into that? This is a government in meltdown and an economic policy in tatters. And frankly, I think the Conservative Party should be hanging its head in shame at what it is putting the country through. You know, this is about people's livelihoods, people's homes, people's mortgages. And you have a government, and let's be clear about why this has happened, you have a government that embarked on a strategy of saying, let's have massive tax cuts for the richest in society, for big corporations, so-called trickle-down economics, which isn't going to work, uh, and also they're trashing the economic institutions of the country, like the Office of Budget Responsibility. That is why the markets have reacted uh, as they have. That is why there's been such a loss of confidence uh, in the government and the government's economic policy, and that's why the budget has got to be ripped up. Well, as far as Kwasi Kwarteng is concerned, Greg Hans, who was in this, this studio in that seat just a, a short while ago, says it's not unusual to, to cut short uh, trips to, to the IMF meetings, and the main meetings had already taken place. You know, I think people will be furious that the government is taking people for fools. You know, let's... I saw Greg Hans' interview, and he says it's somehow that this is a global phenomenon. It is not a global phenomenon. There's no other finance minister who's rushing back on an aeroplane uh, early from the IMF meetings. There's no other country where its central bank said to have an emergency buying spree. There's no other country where a government's economic policy is falling apart uh, at the seams. You know, this is, this is a collective meltdown on the part of the government. And, I, I, you know, the British people deserve so much better than what this government is putting the country through. You say you want to see the mini-budget ripped up. What elements do you want to see reversed? First of all, the corporation tax uh, cut, or the, the refusal to go ahead with the rise which was baked in. Let's be clear, that's £18 billion of unfunded tax cuts. Uh, there were other measures, like the stamp duty cut, like the uh, abolishing VAT for foreign visitors here, all kinds of unfunded tax cuts in that category. We also need a proper windfall tax to help fund the package. And crucially, and this is, this is the, these two other really important things, we can't have a situation where the independent Office of Budget Responsibility is locked in a cupboard because that's part of what led to the problems we've seen. You know, they were, they were, they were basically gagged by the government. And then, crucially also, we need an economic strategy that is credible in terms of growth. You see, the government isn't wrong to say it wants to see more growth and that they failed over 12 years. They have failed over 12 years to bring growth. But we're not going to get growth if we believe in some 
extreme fringe theory that cutting taxes for the ultra-wealthy is going to produce growth. We need to actually invest in the country, like in the green economy of the future, which is what a Labour government would do. You say scrap the mini-budget, and yet you support elements of it, don't you? You support the reversal of the national insurance rise, the cut in the basic rate of income tax, well, we, all measures in the mini-budget. Well, we led the way in saying that the government shouldn't be raising national insurance on ordinary families, and we've said we're not going to reverse. If we were in government and the basic rate cut, which was already programmed in, is in place, we weren't going to reverse but that. But that's because, but that's because, we, that's because we're not in favour of raising taxes on ordinary people. But more than half, more than half of the measures uh, in the mini-budget were measures we opposed. We also said there should be a proper uh, windfall tax uh, to help pay for the energy price uh, measures that were taken. And, and then it goes to this other point, which is, what is your economic strategy? Is there a credible economic strategy? Do you Are you trashing the institutions of the country or are you upholding them? But you say you want the mini-budget scrapped and yet you back key elements of it. You can't have it both ways, can you? Well, no, we're, what we're saying is that we wouldn't reverse the basic rate. We would, you know, the, the question we would face if we came into government, if the basic rate cut is in place or, and the national insurance, um, the reversal of the national insurance rise, is would we raise taxes on ordinary families on 12 and a half pounds a year. Well, we're not going to do that. Um, but let's be clear, this is the government that came forward with its strategy. It's got to go back to a, a blank slate, start again and come up with a credible plan, a credible plan with fiscal numbers that add up. Do you have fiscal numbers that add up? We haven't really seen Labour's costings well, for well, its well, proposals. Well, no, that's not absolutely not true. We, we cost... We, set out the, the costings for everything we propose. You know, we've said, for example, that we would have more doc nurses and doctors, and we've shown how getting rid of the so-called non-DOM status, which allows foreign citizens to be here and not pay their taxes, that could raise about £3 billion. We've shown how we can invest in education by getting rid of uh, the VAT relief on private school fields. So absolutely everything we, we set out, everything... Uh, we propose is fully funded. And that is the difference. Labour is the responsible party in British politics. You know, I was, I was here a few weeks ago saying that the, the Conservatives were being fiscally irresponsible by having an energy price uh, guarantee, energy price package, which was only funded by borrowing, not a windfall tax. And people said, oh, it's surprising, Labour's taking the Tories for fiscal irresponsibility. And then we see, saw that added to uh, in the budget that Kwasi Kwarteng uh, produced. On the subject of energy, which obviously is your brief, yeah. um, you, you're talking about fracking today. You've been very critical of the government's plans to lift the ban on fracking. So what are you going to do about it? Well, we are going to do everything we can through the House of Commons, and there is support across the House of Commons for, for carrying on with the ban on fracking uh, to try and force the government to change its mind. Why is fracking not the answer? First of all, it will make no difference to gas prices, because whether gas is produced here or, or produced internationally, we pay the same price for it. Secondly, the government gave a categorical assurance in their manifesto. They said, we are not going to restart fracking unless it can be categorically shown to be safe. And, and they haven't got the evidence. And, yet, and, they're, and they're breaking and they're they breaking say, their promise. Since then, Russia has invaded Ukraine. That's had a massive impact on energy prices. And they say that it's in the national interest uh, to more, reintroduce look, fracking. There's more extreme fringe views from a government that is of the extreme fringe of the Conservative Party. Look. Boris Johnson opposed fracking. Kwasi Kwarteng himself said a few months ago fracking will make no difference to energy prices. Much so how better. Do you stop it? Well, much better to go ahead with Labour's plans for a clean energy sprint, for ze a zero carbon power system by 2030. For example, the, the government is also talking about blocking solar energy the equivalent of 10 nuclear power stations worth of solar energy, that's completely wrong. Solar energy is the cheapest form of power that we have. How do we stop it? We'll do everything we can to work with MPs from across parties, Conservative MPs. I'm talking to some Conservative MPs. We, I will do everything we can to, to try and stop this. How, how many Tory MPs are prepared to go against the government? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I know there is a lot of disquiet from talking to Conservative MPs about this. We'll, we will find a way of testing... Uh, opinion in the House of Commons. You know, we get opposition days and we're thinking about how we can use uh, that time uh, to, to have uh, votes on fracking, but we do want to stop this. And, you know, the other thing is, uh, and, and, you know, it's so clear to me that um, 
people in the country don't want fracking. It's, it's the least popular form of uh, energy that they, that well, they can well, be. But the government says it'll only go ahead if they have local concerns. Well, they don't quite say that. Liz Truss said that during her leadership campaign. Uh, they haven't... They, she cannot say what local consent even means, and there is a fear that they're going to actually bypass local people when it comes to fracking, and that will be quite wrong. And, and on the subject of, of, of solar farms, Liz Truss did say she'd block them on agricultural yes. land during her leadership yes. campaign, but her argument would be, wouldn't it, that they, we need to boost food production at a time when food prices are soaring and we can't afford to import them. And the biggest threat to food security is the climate crisis. And, you know, how much... Because Liz Truss has sort of made much of this fact that solar farms are apparently destroying all our farmland. Do you know how much farmland is actually being used by solar panels at the moment? 0.1%. One one-thousandth of, of uh, farmland, and even if we increase solar panels by five times, it would be only half a percent of farmland. I'm afraid it's... You see, there is a piece of this with, with what we saw in the budget. We've got a party that has got dangerous, extreme views, that's essentially taken over the Conservative Party and is now trying to impose those views uh, on the country. And it is bad for the country. It's the wrong priorities for Britain. I asked this question to, to, to Greg Hands. Do you expect... Um... Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss to be in office in a month's time? I have absolutely no idea. But you know what? The Conservative Party seems really worried about the trashing of the Conservative Party. I'm worried about the trashing of the country. I'm worried about people's mortgages. I'm worried about the, the spectacle, the, the impact this is having on people across Britain. And I honestly believe that the whole of the Conservative Party bears responsibility for this. They elected Liz Truss. They, they imposed yet another Prime Minister uh, on us. You know, I feel like they're gamblers at the casino. They bet the house on, a, on one Prime Minister, then they get rid of them, and they bet the house on another Prime Minister. There's only one answer for this, which is the Conservative Party to get out of the way and let a Labour government uh, govern the country. OK, Ed Miliband, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Well, the Chancellor was supposed to be staying in Washington until later on today, so some people will be surprised that he's cut his trip short. But International Trade Secretary Greg Hans told me that his sudden change of plans isn't out of the ordinary. It's not unusual. I've been a government minister about 10 years to come back uh, a day early uh, from an international visit. Uh, he's coming back for discussions with colleagues. We obviously have the medium-term fiscal plan coming up on the 31st of October. So just in a couple of weeks' time, there's work to be done, there's conversations to be had with colleagues. Are we not going to get any update later today? Will we get an update today on how the government is going to respond to the, the market turmoil? Well, look, the government will make responses as appropriate uh, as events happen. But the, uh, the, the absolutely commitment is to publish the medium-term fiscal plan. So our political correspondent Rob Powell is here to, to chat through some of those political interviews we've done this morning. And uh, Greg Hans there, very keen to say it's not unusual for a Chancellor to cut short a trip to the IMF in Washington. Nothing to see here. Yeah, Kwasi Kwarteng in the air now on the way back from Washington, cutting that trip short by a day. As you say, Greg Hans, a newly appointed trade minister, saying that it's not unusual. I don't think that's quite the whole truth. I think given the, given the, the context of what's going on on markets, what's going on here in the UK, discussions that have been going on in Number 10 about junking parts of the mini-budget, um, I think you, it would be fair to read a little bit more into, shall we say that. And when you interviewed Lord Ed Vasey there, Conservative peer, um, he said it wasn't quite right to say this isn't unusual. Cutting short a trip like this um, was unusual in, a circumstance, in circumstances um, like this. So what do we read into it? Well, you asked Greg Hans about whether we could expect any more U-turns. I think he said, let's see. You questioned him on some, some of the specifics of the mini-budget. He said the national insurance cut had already gone through the Commons, so that was set in stone. But on corporation tax, which was set to rise, Liz Truss said that wasn't going to happen and there's been a lot of speculation um, that that could be one of the U-turns. I think his exact quote um, was that the Chancellor and the PM were determined to stick to the plan, but let's see how this pans out in the wider scheme. So. Still emphasising, I thought, that October the 31st date for the next step of the growth plan to be laid out, that medium-term fiscal strategy. People in number 10 this morning are saying the same thing. They're saying October the 31st is the date. It's very hard, I think, when you package up the Chancellor coming back a day early 
with um, what we've seen really over the last couple of weeks and what we may see in the coming days on markets to think that the government won't have to say something before then in just over two weeks' time. Now, what does that mean for the political fortunes of both Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss? Well, I expect that will play out in the coming hours and days uh, when Kwasi Kwarteng sits down with Liz Truss and they decide um, what to do. Uh, Ed Vasey seemed pretty sure that they probably could cling on, maybe because the alternative, having another leadership contest, um, was worse. But I think for a Prime Minister that spent all summer really carving her political offering around tax cuts, if she's forced to junk all of that, it's very hard to see really how she stays in place with any sort of political authority. And Labour, meanwhile, calling for a scrapping of the mini-budget, but there are key elements they do back in it. Yeah, this is the thing with Labour, is that they want, I think, the political um, attack line of saying, get rid of this mini-budget. But when you drill down in some of the big specific measures, like a penny off basic rate of income tax, Labour support that, reversing the national insurance cut. Labour supported that and they didn't even oppose it in the Commons when it went through um, on Tuesday. So there's a little bit of sort of political game playing going on here. And I think that speaks to a broader point within Labour at the moment, that whilst they're waging quite an effective attack campaign on the Conservatives, I mean, it's probably not hard at the moment, um, if we're being honest, actually, when it comes to their own figures and whether their own numbers add up, it's not at all clear that they actually do. OK, Rob, well, thanks very much indeed. And I'll see you a little bit later on. Uh, let me just bring you a little bit of breaking news that's just come into us. Uh, Royal Mail is consulting on a programme of job cuts which is expected to see around 10,000 full-time roles axed by August next year. Now, this is according to its parent group, International Distribution Services, and uh, we'll bring you more details on that and more reaction to that in the next hour. Now, with little government guidance on how to cope with rising energy bills heading into the winter, one restaurant in Cheshire has taken matters into its own hands. In a protest at the impact of spiralling costs, the owners of the next-door restaurant are opening without the use of electricity or gas. So here to tell us a little bit more is the owner, Vicky Nuttall. Uh, very good morning to you, Vicky Nuttall. Thanks very much for talking to us. So tell us a little bit about what you're calling a back-to-basics event. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Thank you for having me. We, um, we're actually putting an event together. It's a, uh, a, a nine course tasting event uh, with a drinks pairing that we're going to deliver entirely without the use of, of any power from, from start to finish. So that's during all the prep and then actually the delivery of it as well. It's, um, it's been a big challenge for us to put together. So tell us a little bit about how you're going to cook stuff, how you're going to keep food fresh. I think even you're not using refrigeration, are you? No, no. So we've um, had an incredible collection of like-minded businesses come together to help us deliver this, uh, this incredible kind of task. Um, so we've had a, a charcoal oven company, Harrison, that have agreed to lend us an incredible charcoal oven for the evening. I uh, will also be using some fire pits, grills. Um, our suppliers are on board. They're delivering goods actually in the minute that we need them. Even our vegetable suppliers actually harvesting and bringing the vegetables to us. Um, that's growing field. We have got an incredible bakery on board. The Bear Bakery have been developing a sourdough that they can make and prove without using power or mixing. And they'll be baking it on the nights as well. It's just a huge community effort to come together and do this. So why are you doing this? Is this a, a protest of, of some kind or is this about saving money and saving energy? So it's, it's kind of both, really. Um, I've just been listening to all of your reporting there, um, obviously politically, and I, 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 we are normal people and I think a lot of people feel like there are so many decisions being made that are entirely out of our control that actually we sat down when the energy crisis first started and thought, well, what can we control? What can we do? And deciding to cut the way we use energy was the only thing that we had in our arsenal. So the, it spiralled from there. And then when other people started getting on board, it gained this amazing traction. And, and you know, some of these uh, techniques we can actually bring into our normal operation. Um, you know, safely. This has all been put together with with us being able to deliver it safely in a in a modern way. 
And, and lots of other restaurants, lots of companies up and down the country will be feeling similar pressures. I mean, the government would say it's brought in help in the form of its business uh, energy support package. How much difference is that making to you? It, it makes a big difference. I think it makes a big difference to everyone. We were looking at, at uh, power costs of a uh, monthly of around about £6,000. And now I think it will be somewhere closer to four. Um, but there's still that is astronomically different to where we were sitting this time, you know, even six months ago, and it's come out of the blue. And I don't think people are set up to to change their logistics to to that level required to actually bring our bills in line. It's 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 still almost unmanageable um, completely for so many people. Well, uh, I, good luck with the event. I hope it goes well. I hope it, it, it teaches you a, a few uh, tricks that m you might be able to carry on to the, the normal day service. But uh, Vicky Nuttall, really interesting to, to hear your plans. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Now, have you ever wondered what career Prince William might have had uh, if he wasn't royalty? Well, let's take a look at this. maybe boxing. Uh, the Prince of Wales uh, put on his boxing gloves yesterday as he celebrated the 10th anniversary anniversary of the charity Coach Corps, which was established by his Royal Foundation. Uh, he was also joined by the Princess of Wales at the Copper Box Arena in East London. And uh, I don't think she boxed. I haven't got any pictures of her, she did. Uh, he praised the power of sport and he congratulated the organisation which trains the next generation of sports coaches. I'm not a boxer. But look quite good to me. I don't know. Uh, coming up in the next hour here on Sky News Breakfast, we'll have plenty more on those expectations of another U-turn in the mini-budget. So do stay with us.